Do I see people coming in? Does anyone know? There's usually a few second delay. Oh. But then we should see them coming in, yeah. You've done this before, Kristen? Yeah. I should have had you do it. No, I've never <laughs> run, I've never run it. No, I've just been a <laughs> participant. <laughs> I would be even worse than you. This is why I married a computer engineer, Catherine. <laughs> even worse than me. Thanks. That's really good for my confidence. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> all right. I'm going to mute myself. Um, why don't we all mute? That would be a good idea, right?
So, hi everybody, we're gonna start now. Can you hear me, Kristen? Can you give me a nod? Okay. Hi everybody, welcome to the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care virtual side event on the right of older persons to palliative care in Albania, the Philippines, the US and Zambia, which aligns with the open-ended working group's consideration this session, this 13th session, one of which um, the, the questions they're considering is the right of older persons to access health services. I'm Dr. Catherine Pettis, Senior Advocacy and Partnerships Director for the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, IHBC. And I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to the organization and to the issue and to these wonderful presenters, our members, who serve older persons in their own countries. And although these countries are diverse, so you can see they're from all over the world, and the context of their work are very different, let me assure you that the plight of older persons with palliative care needs is global. You will only hear a few examples of the work that's being done to take care of them, but I can assure you that palliative care must be universalized so that older persons can end their days well wherever they are. Uh, briefly, um, I just saw a question in the chat, when will the recording be available at the end of the session? Um, so I'm not gonna address any questions till the end of the session, hopefully we have time. Um, very briefly, the IHPC is a global membership organization in official relations with the World Health Organizations and in consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council, or ECASOC. We have individual and institutional members in 108 count countries at last count, 12 advocacy focal points, and five leadership development grantees in Albania, Burkina Faso, the Philippines, Colombia, and Zambia, some of whom you will hear from today. And our vision is towards a world free from health-related suffering. I'm gonna explain that very briefly. Palliative care is the clinical discipline that addresses health-related suffering. And by relieving suffering, palliative care enables agency and restores subjectivity to people who can otherwise be awash in pain of many kinds. Palliative care is defined as the active holistic care of individuals across all ages with serious health-related suffering, including those near the end of life. It aims to improve the quality of life of patients, their families, and their caregivers. This is a consensus-based definition, which is expanded and modeled on the WHO definition from the year 2000. And it was published in 2019. It's been endorsed by hundreds of institutions and individuals all over the world. So suffering is health-related when it's associated with illness or injury of any kind. It's serious when it requires professional intervention and compromises physical, social, spiritual, or emotional functioning. And it's severe when it carries a risk of mortality, a high risk, excuse me, when it negatively impacts quality of life and daily function and or is burdensome in symptoms, treatments, or caregiver stress. Projected serious health-related suffering rates, and this is done by experts all around the world in academia, by 2060, an estimated 48 million people globally will die experiencing serious health-related suffering. This is an 87% increase from 2016. 83% of those deaths will occur in low and middle income countries, deaths with serious health-related suffering. And serious health-related suffering is increasing most rapidly among older persons, age 70 and above, and 183% increase this, this marks between 2016 and 2060. And dementia is going to be the main cause next to cancer. 
the global unmet need for palliative care. According to WHO, only 14% of people globally who need palliative care receive it. So you do the math, that means 85% is unmet need. So IHPC sees this as simultaneously a tragedy for those who are not receiving care and an opportunity for member states to live up to their now many multilateral commitments to provide palliative care for their citizens and inhabitants of their countries. I took this particular photo in Panama. It's a nurse who's working for the government social security division, providing palliative care to a patient in their home in a very poor rural area. If this gentleman didn't have palliative care, didn't have a government provided wheelchair, he wouldn't be able to sit out on the patio with his family. He'd be bed bound and probably in very bad shape. This is how, this is how palliative care should be. It should be provided through the, the public sector. And Panama has been a terrific leader among a few other countries, among member states in promoting palliative care as a public obligation. So that's what um, IHPC advocates for. And now um, I'm just gonna mention the rights-based framework um, for this side event, uh, which takes a rights-based right, rights perspective. Palliative care is a recognized component of the right to health and to life and security of the person, as well as to be free from torture. It derives from a deep and broad normative lineage, and we were grateful to the Human Rights Council for the Resolution 48.3, which recognizes the challenge in accessing long-term and palliative care and encourages all states to take measures to provide long-term support and palliative care services for older persons, because this is a resolution on older persons. And of course, this resolution is based on agreed human rights language from the cornerstone conventions, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and others. So I'm gonna stop here and introduce our first speaker, Dr. May Rumeli Corbera from the Philippines. Dr. Corbera is the founding president of the Ruth Foundation for Palliative and Hospice Care and president of the National Palliative and Hospice Care Council of the Philippines. She founded the Ruth Foundation to make life better for those facing advanced illness and age. She will now share her presentation, after which I will introduce Drs. Laska, Dr. Forner, and Dr. Mata. So the floor is yours, May, and you can now share your presentation. Thank you so much, Catherine. Sorry for that lag. Um, so good morning, uh, although I know in Manila it's good evening. It's 10 o'clock where I am. So I first wanna thank um, the organizers of the United Nations Open-Ended Working Group on Aging for allowing us this session in advocacy of our older Filipinos. In the time that I have, I will share uh, and focus on one very important human right, which bears great significance in their quality of life. And we call this dangal. This, however, is not often considered as an intervention to address health-related suffering in as much as it should. But in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so, I'll go through the following objectives. I'll describe the older Filipino population and its forecasts and other quality of life determinants. I will also share common Filipino cultural practices towards our older persons. And then I will also go on to share a not so happy room story. Towards the end, I will share specific areas of advocacy for our older, particularly the indigent Filipinos. So in 2015, the population, the older Filipinos composed 7.5% of our population. And 
as we see here, there was continued growth over the five years that followed and then projected over the next nine to 10 years, the elder population will compose 14% of our population. In the Philippines, senior citizens are defined as those age 60 and above, though retirement age would vary for those who are in government and in private, in the private sector. We see here that there are also general descriptors that give us an idea of the factors that may influence their overall sense of well being. A majority have low educational profile, and generally, they no longer are given opportunity to work after retirement age, and in course have little to no financial stability nor independence. And this would cause most of them to live with their children. And as of, of course, a result of the natural process of aging and morbidities that come with age, a good 50 to 60% may experience moderate levels of pain. I can also imagine most of this pain is poorly controlled as another distinct trait of Filipinos is our tendency to tolerate pain, to tolerate suffering or even deny it. And of course it may be to, due to the lack of knowledge or resources in order to address it, but it could also be because of a common fatalistic attitude which causes us to simply accept suffering. This now ushers us to look into this offering called Dangal, an offering to our older citizens and its significance, the significance of respect, honor, dignity, and a good reputation, a good name. Though not openly demanded of those younger, it is a value deeply rooted in our culture with silent and perhaps critical imposition much more a determinant of our overall health or the overall health of older Filipinos, their psychological, spiritual, social, and even their physical well-being. This specific gesture here in this uh, photo of Manopo is something I also had to learn and practice as I saw and felt how much it uplifted and strengthened the spirit of each senior citizen I had the honor of honoring through this simple act of respect, which now leads me to share of an encounter that the home visiting team of the Ruth Foundation had during their project, Happy Room. Now this is during a scoping visit of older Filipinos in our immediate community who are to be recipients of this project, Happy Room. They found one particular lady residing in a neighborhood of informal settlers, or we would call them squatters, who was completely blind. Yet she was also occupying a very small dark room at the side of her daughter's home. Double darkness, they called it. Upon the physical exam of the home care nurse, a deep abrasion was noted at the top of her scalp with surrounding scarring, as she oftentimes would hit the surface of her head on the side walls, her bed, or on the floor, as oftentimes she had no companion. So apparently unattended to for a number of days, the home care team bathed her and helped her don on a fresh set of clothes. Now this scenario may just be one of hundreds and thousands of among those 4 million indigent elderly of our population. This happy room intervention was not anything complicated or expensive, but it offered this key intervention of Dangal. So now I proceed to share with you these areas of advocacy that carry with it this basic right of Dangal or respect or dignity for our older Filipinos. The intervention of public honoring as a community tradition. And I share this through a partnership project we did in one of the larger commercial centers in our city. We called it Instagram, wherein blown up portraits of our elderly citizens were placed in the center of the mall 
honoring them through the sharing of their stories. And this was part of the Compassionate Community Campaign of the Foundation. Another area of advocacy is home care support services for our older Filipinos, which is a key primary palliative care program or intervention. Back in 2010, there was an actual administrative order set out by the Department of Social Welfare and Development. And in this AO, there was uh, stipulated the benefit of having a community-based program for those who were sick, frail, and bedridden, and as in our story, abandoned and neglected. This could have been strengthened perhaps by a parallel legislation. And had this been implemented to the full, maybe some 12 years ago, we may not have had, we may have had a brighter story to tell. This AO also uh, formed the guidelines for home care volunteers who would be an active, uh, would take an active role in providing the care that our older population deserves in their own homes. Another and a third final area of advocacy I'd like to share is better retirement benefits, where we can strengthen our voice for a more rational benefit for our elderly. It was quoted that the biggest problem of our aging population is their inability to live well, and that the number of indigent seniors in our country receiving a social pension of around $20 US dollars a month by the DSWD is actually 4.1 million, which represents already a third of our total number of Filipino senior citizens. Now, our law also provides incentive of 100,000 pesos, or $2,000 to, to our older persons who turn 100 years of age. And there's actually a proposal to offer an incentive of 1 million pesos to those who reach 101. Now, the counter proposal is that instead of giving these large sums of incentives at an age where they perhaps may no longer be able to enjoy them to the full, is to, lose, is to use these large sums of the same rationally to give benefits to those senior citizens at an early age, especially those considered indigent. So moving forward, here is the rundown of a response to this call for Dangal, this plight for a basic yet very key right of our older Filipinos, at least 4 million of them. The call to lead more compassionate community projects and highlight participation of family and community units for the care of our older Filipinos. To provide legislation that would strengthen that administrative order back in 2010 for the rollout of home care support for our senior citizens. And lastly, a legislation that will provide better and more rational retirement benefits, especially for the 4.1 million indigent older Filipinos. So I end with this quote, that if tolerance, respect, and equity permeate family life and community, they will translate into values that shall shape societies, nations, and the world. And this is to quote Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations. And with this, I thank you and good evening. Thank you, Rumali. That was beautiful. What a great example for the rest of the world um, to honor our older citizens like that. Oh. So my next um, introduction is um, Dr. Irena Laska. Um, Irena, while I'm introducing you, why don't you start sharing? Dr. Irena is a nurse by her background and has been working in palliative care in Albania since 1999. She has directed the um, Mary Potter Palliative Care Center um, on hospice in Korja, I don't know if I said that right, Korja, Albania since 2004, leading an interdisciplinary team of 20 people who provide palliative care for patients with incurable diseases from all the southeastern region of the country. 
So she's working as a um, lead grantee, that's leadership development grantee of the IHPC to integrate palliative care into primary health care for older persons in Albania. So the floor is yours, Dr. Irena. Thank you, Kathleen, for presenting me. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure for me to be panelists in this very important event to develop uh, service, uh, healthcare service for older people everywhere. First, I wanted to share with you the topic that I have chosen to present. It's palliative care in primary health care for older people. Why I chose this uh, topic? Working in palliative care, as you presented me, we faced with many problems, uh, challenges, and needs of uh, people in need for palliative care, and especially in this uh, time for older people. I'll, I'll share with you a history in, which is coming from my daily work. Uh, Mrs. Oli is a uh, 72 years old lady suffering from cancer and other many other symptoms because of cancer and other disease that she has. She is uh, diabetic, she has uh, uh, cardiac failure, and she is suffering from the pain the bone pain and the abdominal pain. She feels so weak that uh, she cannot go to the toilet or use the commode by herself for her personal needs. She needs to use a deeper, which uh, she changed once a day because her only caregiver is uh, her sister who is also elder, elderly and she has health problems herself as well. When the patient contacted her family healthcare doctor, she was referred to the palliative care center because the doctor said that it's not her task to look after uh, Oli because she has cancer. The patient is uh, regularly followed by the palliative care nurse who is visiting her twice a week, but Oli needs uh, continuously care because she needs to, to do some injection and to, to change some uh, to, to have some other manipulation to control the symptoms and assure her comfort. The family healthcare nurse, so important and necessary for ladies in this sexual health uh, situation, goes to see her only when the patient calls her and asks her for help, but does not offer frequent care for, for patients. They often say that the only service she needs is palliative care and the primary health care nurses and doctors can't provide this kind of care. Irena, so, Irena, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Are you meaning to move your slides or do you want to be on the title slide? No, no I'm, I'm finishing the story and then I'll move the, the, the slide. Okay, my apologies. I'm, I'm at the end, yes, because I'll give the meaning to my presentation. The only hand knocking on the patient's door is that of the palliative care nurse offering care and comfort for patients. So giving care for this, these patients and listening to her history that nobody except a, a palliative care nurse going and look after her. In my mind came some question, what is the role of uh, primary health care doctors and nurse? What are their responsibilities? To whom does Mrs. Oli belongs? What kind of service can provide, be provided by primary health care? There are many patients like her in Albania who lives in urban or uh, rural areas where palliative care does not exist. What happen, happens to them? Can this type of service, primary health, uh, public health care, ensure quality of life and an end with dignity for patients? Uh, this was the story who push me to, to, to tell more. The target group that we are looking after are children, adults, and old people. In the palliative care setting that we, I'm living, we are offering home care, hospice care, and a lot of education, for, uh, especially for primary health care doctors and nurses. And all the patients we are looking after, are, uh, they are diagnosed with cancer. We know that there are many people in need for palliative care, but it is impossible for staff about 20 people to look after this uh, increased number of patients in need for palliative care. And then for this reason, 
we choose them to look after only after cancer patient. But another question, what is happening with the other patients with incurable disease or older people in need for palliative care? Who is taking care for them? Who is treating their suffering, their pain? Uh, disaggregation by the age group shows that out of 275 patients who have received palliative care from the staff of Mary Potter Palliative Care Center uh, in the southeast region of Albania for 2022, 190 of them were over 65 years old, which means they are older people. More than about 70% of our patients are older people. So they are in need for palliative care, not only because they have cancer, but they have other disease. They have high blood pressure, they have diabetes, they have Alzheimer, dementia, osteoporosis, so many, many other uh, diseases and many symptoms that they need to be treated. Some data regarding the, the situation in Albania, regarding the, the older people, at least 91,000 older people in our country need long-term care. 2% of them are currently receiving this service and mainly from their family members. In 2050, the number of people potentially need for long-term care will increase in 161,000. So it's double. About 60% of patients who lose their lives in a year need palliative care and only a small number of people benefit from this service because palliative care in our country is offering only by some uh, non-profits or NGOs, non-profit organization in, in our capital in Southeast uh, region of Albania and uh, one in the North and another one in the, in the South part of the country. What is happening with other people in need for palliative care? We have the strategy, the Minister of Health and Social Issue have the strategy uh, for the year 2020 and 2025. And it, it is going the same with the, the strategy of the WHO. In this strategy is written that primary health care is a basic service for controlling of disease and promoting health for entire country. The role of uh, primary health care is promoting health, prevention and control of non-communicable disease, care for patients with non-communicable disease, which is palliative care, home care service for older people uh, who they, as I told, have many uh, or several diseases and many symptoms, they need palliative care and models of healthcare through digital technology, especially for the people living in remote, uh, very deep remote area. The public uh, primary healthcare strategy aims to improve the reputation of the, the healthcare provider, health esteem and motivation of healthcare workers, and make, uh, make them understand the power they have to improve quality of life for patients and to ensure the uh, end uh, with dignity for all the people in need for palliative care. There are many challenges for healthcare system in Albania and many challenges for older people as well. The older people living in urban or rural, rural area, they have lack of frequent visit by the staff of uh, healthcare centers, of the primary healthcare providers. Loneliness, isolation and disability of them to move from the house and to go to the healthcare centers to receive the care. The people who are living in uh, very deep uh, rural areas, they they are, there are lack of 24 hours health service for them and lack of involvement of health personnel in the provision of care in the patient's home. So we, we thought that it is the time to, to, to make something, to move. And the purpose of the intervention is to do lobby and advocacy to train our uh, colleagues providing or working in primary health care and to raise awareness regarding the care that the older people need to, to 
make the, the people, the community aware about the, the challenges of older people living in their home, living alone with very, very uh, high social needs as well. We wanted to ensure access to healthcare service for all the older people who are unable and in need for this service, in need for palliative care. We want to ensure quality of life and dignity for all. The young people, the children, and especially for all the people. And we want to ensure birth free from suffering of health problems, even for old people and old patients. We, we thought that it is time to start training our colleagues about care needed for, for older people. We prepared the program, which was a T of T, training of trainers. And we thought to start with the, the primary healthcare providers, physicians and nurses. We organized this kind of training in 11 cities of Albania. And the topic was care for older people. The number of participants in these 11 courses were 292 and 122 of them were physicians and 170 of them were nurses. And there are some other trainings that we have provided for 519 other healthcare providers in different topics. All participants will have the, the, the opportunity to share this information with other colleagues because they have been the group of, scholars, the group of colleagues to share uh, this uh, information they received in uh, T of T training for older people. Then we continue to share other expertise and to do to, to take them, the nurses and doctors working in primary health care, to make them to, to, to take them and to see their patients at patients' home. We give our expertise, we evaluate, we assess the patients, we try to treat them, and then we go back again to reassess them and to see the, the, the situation and uh, how their symptoms and their health problems change after our treatment and evaluation. And then we continued with uh, some trainings in the class, doing case study, doing role play, and sharing our experience in, experiences and expertise with other colleagues and make them understand better the, the problems and the needs and of the patients and the ways we need to interfere uh, to, to change our approach for older people. We need partners and we need the support of uh, public health institution. But uh, how can they help us? We have discussed with uh, in several meetings with our stakeholders and we want to, to make them understand that it's time for the new organization of primary health care and its orientation towards the provision of palliative care for anyone with an incurable disease, disease especially for older people wherever, wherever uh, they live. Integration of palliative care at the public health care institution and quintessence of primary health personnel with the problems, symptoms and syndromes and the needs of older people continuous education for health personnel of uh, primary health care about palliative care for older people and increasing awareness of the community about the role of primary health care. If they don't know the role of their doctors and nurses, they can't go there and ask them uh, for help. I want to close my presentation with these very beautiful pictures for me. Romina is una, uh, one of our nurses who uh, is looking after, especially after older people. Uh, she is a lady living alone and she is smiling all the time that the nurse of palliative care goes to her home and talking to them and treat her problems. And one day she said, we are the only hope that knocks on my door. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irena. That was beautiful. That made me smile at the end too. Um, yeah. 
Thank you for sharing that and about the training work that you're doing, because as we all know, given what we've even heard from the last few presentations, the number of people in need, which we know is growing exponentially compared to the number of people we can actually serve, means one big thing that we have to keep training people and we need public provision, as you said, of palliative care integrated into primary health care. Because without that, there's no way we're going to serve the amount of people that need to be served. Um, so thank you for bringing that out. Um, if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing, then Kristen, Dr. Forner, you can start your presentation. And while you share, Kristen, I am going to introduce you. Dr. Kristen Forner is the Regional Palliative Care Program Director for MedStars, Southern Maryland region in the United States. She is an IHPC advocacy focal point overseeing the programs at both Southern Maryland Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital. She has a long and impressive bio, as do all the panelists, which you will find on her LinkedIn page. And she's representing IHPC at the open-ended working group in person and gave a statement yesterday on the right of older persons to access health care. So Dr. Forna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Catherine. Good morning. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I am the Southern Maryland Regional Palliative Care Program Director for MedStar Health and the American uh, Advocacy Focal Point for the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. Today, I'm gonna to talk with you about the palliative care needs in the United States and my experience serving an urban, aging, often low or low to middle income, racially diverse population. In the United States, though we are one of the richest countries in the world and spend a higher percentage of our GDP on healthcare than any other country, there remains a high unmet need for palliative care. Only 72% of US hospitals with 50 or more beds report having a palliative care program. 90% of these hospitals are in urban areas. So sadly, this means only 17% of hospitals in rural areas with 50 or more beds can report having a palliative care program. <clears throat> the unmet need for palliative care in the United States comes from inadequate workforce, to meet the needs of patients living with serious illness and their families, insufficient financing and financial incentives to ensure equitable and reliable access to palliative care, a lack of accountability, and gaps in the evidence base to build the science that guides our clinical practice, insufficient clinician training and communication, pain and symptom management, and psychosocial and spiritual assessment and support as well as a continued lack of knowledge about the benefits of palliative care and who may benefit from it. All of this data comes from the Center to Advance Palliative Care and their Palliative Care Report Card in 2019. On January 23rd, 2014, the Executive Board of the World Health Organization passed a resolution declaring for people with life-limiting illnesses that access to essential medicines and palliative care contributes to the realization of the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and well being. As Catherine mentioned, palliative care is the active, holistic care of individuals across all ages with serious health related suffering. Holistic care means whole person centered care, and palliative care teams are often tasked to address all eight of these domains that make up a whole person. Palliative care therefore requires multiple disciplines in order to provide this kind of whole person centered care. Ideally, palliative care teams would consist of at least some, if not many of these disciplines. However, across the United States, palliative care teams are often composed of only one discipline, maybe two. Conditions warranting palliative care include cancer and non-cancer diagnoses. Cancer, dementia, and heart disease remain remain among the top causes of death for patients 65 and older. And as we've been discussing today, palliative care is specialized care to optimize quality of life for any patients suffering from a serious illness 
and can be provided alongside curative or life prolonging interventions like cancer treatments and dialysis. In the United States, most insurance offers a hospice benefit, which makes hospice care free to all patients who have one or more diagnoses that give prognosis of six months or less and who decide to forego life prolonging measures. For patients 65 and older, this benefit is a part of Medicare, which is the government healthcare assistance program offered to older persons. This distinction with diagnosis providing a prognosis of six months or less and the choice to forego aggressive interventions provides a very decisive line between what is palliative care and what is hospice care in the United States. Ideally, palliative care would be initiated further upstream in the course of one's life-limiting illness, nearer to the time of diagnosis. Inpatient palliative care consultation often consists of addressing the acute distress a patient and family may be feeling. This includes pain and non-pain symptom management, as well as emotional and spiritual distress, communication with patients and families around what is happening with the patient medically, giving medical updates and answering questions, addressing their values and what's most important to them so we can better address their goals for their care, and reviewing surrogacy laws by state about who should be a patient's medical decision maker should the patient lose capacity to make decisions for him or herself. And with regard to disposition, this area has to do with the plans for a patient. Is there a plan to withdraw life support during the hospitalization or to assist, sorry, to order hospice care? Or would a patient prefer outpatient palliative care to assist them once they're discharged from the hospital? We assist with ensuring patients' desires for their medical plans are carried out. I practice in the Southern Maryland region. It is an urban community just south of our nation's capital. The largest hospital where I practice serves an older, predominantly low or low to middle income, non-white patient population. Most of our patients receive Medicare and Medicaid assistance for their health care, and these are government insurance programs that assist with low income and elderly persons in the United States. There are three long-term care facilities within two miles of this hospital, and one of them is a ventilator facility, meaning that patients who have undergone tracheostomy or long-term airway in the neck and require long-term mechanical ventilation may live there. Our patients are often transferred to us with recurrent sepsis or infection from pressure wounds, aspiration pneumonias, and urinary tract infections. Over time, their infections become more resistant to antibiotics. This is Jose Luis Vasquez, Jr. Jose was a man in his 60s from a large family with a strong Catholic faith, originally from Puerto Rico. He had some high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, a remote history of smoking, and had recently su suffered from embolic strokes, which are strokes that result when small fragments are broken off from blood clots and travel to the brain. Then in July of 2020, he suffered from COVID-19, which led to more embolic strokes, a known complication of COVID-19. When we met Jose, he was quadriplegic, bedbound, aphasic or no longer verbal, and had undergone tracheostomy, long-term feeding tube placement in the abdomen and diverting colostomy to prevent stool from contaminating his large stage four sacral decubitus ulcer on his backside. This ulcer was among seven other ulcers that he also had all over his body. He came to us from his long-term ventilator facility for recurrent admissions for infections. From March of 2020 to April of 2022, he was admitted nine times. Palliative care saw him on his second admission, second admission at another MedStar hospital. And our team started seeing him on his fifth admission in July of 2021. In total, Jose had 37 touches from palliative care providers. He had a long-term girlfriend, Cindy, and seven siblings who were all acting together to make decisions on his behalf though Cindy and three of his sisters were most involved. As you can see here, he was an avid cyclist. This is Jose when we met him. 
The photo on the left was taken during the pandemic. We dressed his family in full PPE and then allowed them into his intensive care unit room. This is Cindy, a family member captured this kiss. The photo on the right was taken after his sister had shaved him and cut his hair. When we first met Jose, his family was hoping for a miracle, that they would be able to bring him home at or near his baseline functional status. And they wanted to know how we could best heal his wounds and improve his nutritional status in order to help them meet this goal. They were asking for physical therapy, despite his inability to participate in this treatment. Over the course of this and the next four admissions, our team got to know Jose and his family very well. They were seen by every member of our team and by the hospital's Catholic priest. We treated his pain, secretions, constipation and diarrhea, and occasional agitation. We also met with his family many times during these admissions, giving medical updates, answering questions, providing spiritual and psychosocial support, and walking alongside them as they came to understand that Jose's body was slowly dying and that he would not recover and that he would not want to continue the kind of full aggressive care we had been providing him up until that point. After many in-person, virtual, and telephone meetings, in April of 2022, Jose's family decided to transition the care plan to one where we would focus exclusively on his comfort and no longer pursue life-prolonging measures. They agreed to stop his antibiotics and artificial nutrition, and we transferred him to an inpatient hospice facility. He died on Easter morning, which was an enormous source of comfort for his faith-driven family. Coming up on the first anniversary of his death, I reached out to Jose's family a few weeks ago. This is what they said about our care. The palliative care team advocated for Jose's needs and helped us as a family to understand and support him. They also provided the level of detailed communication we needed in order to understand the various medical issues, treatments, and way forward that the teams were proposing for his care. They were able to patiently work with the multiple family dynamics to ensure our voices were being heard and resolve any confusion or questions. That was from Cindy. His sister Maritza said the palliative care team provided our family emotional, spiritual, and medical support with much needed compassion and care at a time when unforeseen illness brought Jose and the family to a screeching halt. We knew that at the end, our brother was at peace. I couldn't imagine any family not being afforded the support of such a care team. And lastly, his sister Ada said, though we were not ready to let him go, the palliative care team helped tremendously with our journey. The world needs to know that palliative care programs are essential. And those were Ada's all capital letters, not mine. So for takeaways in the United States, we have more work to do with regard to workforce initiatives and an emphasis on creating interdisciplinary teams to be able to care for the whole person. Payment incentives, quality standards and research gaps to be filled, clinician skills and increasing skills specifically in communication, symptom management, and psychosocial and spiritual support, and public and clinician awareness about the benefits of palliative care. In the United States, people are living longer, but not necessarily better. Today, most Americans die in a hospital after recurrent admissions for incurable illnesses. Just as Jose's sister Ada stated so eloquently on the last slide, every older person with a life-limiting illness deserves the support of an interdisciplinary palliative care team. Let us continue the work we are doing to make it so. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Jose's sister is doing our advocacy work for us. <laughs> That's right. And um, saying that it should be universalized because I kept imagining through all the presentations what it would be like for these people if if you, the people, the panelists on this webinar weren't there, as well as all the folks we know who are providing palliative care in the world. Um, it's not a world that any of us want to age into. And so we've really got to get our act together. So thanks for that. The other thing I just want to, to mention, I maybe should have mentioned it at the beginning, is that all these photographs and stories, including Irena's and um, uh, and May's, Dr. Corbera's and Dr. Forner's, are being used with permission. 
So um, all those photos and stories are used with permission. I just wanted to make that clear. So now I am going to introduce Dr. Moses Matar. And um, while I do that, maybe you could share your slide, Dr. Matar. Um, Dr. Moses Mata Moses Mata is medical superintendent at Chipata General Hospital in Lusaka and a founder and chair of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias at is in Zambia. His areas of focus are neurology, palliative care and pain management, primary care and dementia, and he is the IAHPC advocacy focal point for Zambia. So uh, take it away, Dr. Matar, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, hello to everyone. And thank you for that introduction. I hope you can all see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Proceed. Okay. So thank you. So as Catherine highlighted, um, the need for palliative care globally is huge, and this is going to shift significantly towards primarily non-cancer conditions. So my work right now is in the area of brain health and particularly dementia. And we know that around the world currently, there are over 55 million people living with dementia and it is the seventh leading cause of death globally. And the costs associated with dementia care are quite staggering with over 1.3 trillion US dollars having been spent around dementia care in 2019. And most of these people living with dementia are in countries like mine in Zambia, low middle income countries. We have a relatively young population. We've been struggling with uh, the HIV pandemic for the past 30, 40 years, which saw a drastic drop in life expectancy. But these figures are now shifting upwards. So in 1990, life expectancy in Zambia was only 49 years. But as we speak currently, the life expectancy for males is around 59 and 65 for women. At present, estimates uh, state that we are probably have about 26,000 people living with dementia currently, and this is expected to increase to around 120,000 by 2050, more than a 359% increase in a very short space of time. And we're expecting to have a standardized age prevalence of dementia around 3.6% of our population. This is important to keep in mind. These numbers are important because at the moment, living with dementia in Zambia can be very challenging. One of the, the patients and, and families that I have, I've had the privilege of caring for, uh, this was a, a husband who attended one of our meetings. I'll, I'll call him Mr. Mumba for the purposes of this presentation. And he has been caring for his wife for going on five plus years living with dementia. And it is a condition that is very rarely talked about. So initially she was cared for at the local clinic. And as most people with dementia are told, initially it's, it was just, you know, it's part of normal aging, but the family noticed that the, her condition was not improving and was just getting worse and worse to the point where she's no longer able to care for herself. She was having hallucinations and ended up being cared for as a mental health patient and, and diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia and was actually admitted to uh, a psychiatric facility for a very long time. And even when she was discharged, she was sedated most of the time with very poor quality of life. So dementia is one of those conditions that lends itself very well to the palliative care approach to care, looking at the elimination of health-related suffering for the patient, their caregivers, and families. So at the moment in Zambia, living with dementia, you tend to have a lot of delays in diagnosis, uh, misdiagnosis, and even when you are diagnosed, there is a lot of social isolation with people being kept in their homes, not being allowed to go outside, not being visited. And there's also a lot of stigma associated with conditions like dementia in Zambia. We have a very large uh, rural population. We have very low levels of um, health literacy 
generally across the country to the extent that patients with dementia are often accused of being witches. They are found wandering in the streets. They are not always clothed. So people associate that kind of behavior with witchcraft. And there have been people who have been threatened. They have been assaulted. And there are even reports of people who have been killed who reasonably could have had dementia. At the moment, as a country, there are a lot of commitments and promises that have been made around palliative care and the care for the aged in Zambia. So for example, as a country, we have adopted the 2017 Global Action Plan on Public Health Response to Dementia, which called for every member country to have a national dementia plan in place and implemented. Unfortunately, this has not yet been done. In addition, we also have a National Palliative Care Strategic Plan, which is meant to run from 2021 to 2026. And this was a very important document for us to have because it guides our approach to palliative care training and how we're going to implement palliative care in Zambia. But unfortunately as well, very little progress has been made on both of these fronts. So this unfortunately leaves a huge gap which has to be met there that those who need palliative care and those who are providing it so that's where organizations like the one that i am representing today alzheimer's disease and related dementias in zambia come in we are a, a non-government organization composed of patients families healthcare workers and the main areas of our focus are awareness and education. People do not know about dementia. They don't know what dementia is. So we do a lot of awareness and education activities. We also work towards linking uh, those in need of care to skilled providers. For example, the hospital I work in services a population of around 500,000 people. And in that population, I am the only neurologist servicing such a huge population. So linking those in need to skilled people is part of what we do. And we're also providing support groups uh, for persons and families living with dementia. Because we can work on risk reduction, we focus a lot of energy around health education on risk reduction. And it's important that we have research, locally generated research in terms of what are the problems that people with, with dementia are living with, what are their palliative care needs within the local Zambian population. And of course, we do a lot of advocacy work try to highlight what dementia is. So these are just a few images. So uh, you can see our organization made up of different people. We, we, we use whatever media we can get uh, the opportunity to, to speak on. So television interviews, we do uh, community visits. This is my colleague, the bottom right. That's our, one of our members, Mr. Anderson Simkukwe in rural Nakonde having an education session. And we recently had a, a health expo day where we went to one of the malls and we're educating people about dementia. And uh, one of our members, Dr. Faith there, is a neurologist as well and was educating people about dementia in Zambia. We have to take action. The numbers are growing and they will affect countries like Zambia. So expecting 139 million people living with dementia globally. So this is going to require concerted efforts from, from, from organizations like as, uh, such as Adiz, but from the national front, it starts with having a national dementia plan that clearly outlines the approach to care for people living with dementia, including palliative care as part of universal health coverage. We have a national palliative care strategic plan, which we must implement. We're already into year three now, so we have to commit to and, and meet the promises outlined in that plan and also implementing the national policy on aging that will guide. So these three documents really will guide on how patients living with dementia are cared for and how palliative care can be integrated as part of that care for persons living with dementia in Zambia. Thank you very much from Zambia. Thank you, Dr. Mata. You're really doing some heavy lifting there. Um, that's very uh, impressive. One of the things that your presentation highlighted was, um, and I'm going to use some UN jargon here and then I'll explain it, is what's called the intersectionality of need. In other words, the woman you showed um, and said she is not a witch, she has dementia. Um, it shows that the need of older women often is greater um, for palliative care and they're often the main caregivers are older women. 
Um, and then this, this mental incapacity that happens as you get older and get dementia creates a whole nother section of um, oppression and, and need um, that caregivers or the public uh, sector has to fill. So um, these panelists for you who are participants in the audience, um, they are doing, as I said at the beginning, the heavy lifting in a few countries, but this is a global need, as many of you know, um, which is why IHPC, for those of you who are at the open-ended working group, this is an open-ended working group side event, this is why IHPC advocates for the inclusion of palliative care in any binding convention on the rights of older persons, which we seem to be getting creeping at least closer towards. I've been attending the working group for at least 10 years now, and, and hopefully it seems as though palliative care will be included in any clause on the right to health but we have to keep working on that. Advocacy is absolutely key to getting all this done, as you all know. But these people who, these, these panelists who you've heard from today, who are all IHPC members and who work on advocacy, they are doing so much with very few resources. One of the only ways to make up for that resource deficit when the public sector doesn't step in is through volunteers, and uh, which is the subject of a whole nother webinar. There was a good question in the Q&A from Sudan. Uh, it wasn't really a question, more of a comment, saying that in Sudan, we need um, and rely on volunteers, but many programs around the world rely on volunteers. I'm a trained hospice volunteer. It's how I got into this. And the Compassionate Communities Movement, which Dr. Corvera referred to as part of her presentation in the Philippines, is also a vehicle that can move this forward because with this tremendous amount of need, with the changing demographics, with younger people, children moving away from the traditional family, you have no caregivers. So you have this situation of people living alone in dreadful conditions like Dr. Corvera shared too. Dr. Forner, Kristen's presentation showed a wonderful family who were getting wonderful services in Maryland, but many people are abandoned. Um, we know that. So there's a huge amount of work to do. There's a global social movement uh, for palliative care, which is extraordinary. I feel tremendously privileged to be a part of that. And um, I welcome you to look at IHPC's website. Um, it's certainly free to look at and browse and we have many resources available. We also invite you to join us because we are like so many organizations around the world. We operate on a wing and a prayer, a shoestring budget. We don't have any big donors. So we rely on our membership. And um, I thank you very much for attending and would love to take some questions because we do have some time. We've got about seven minutes. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask on the air, um, please put them in the Q&A. Oh, okay, so Ramya Sampath, you put your question in the Q&A. Do you wanna ask it live and unmute yourself or do you want me to ask it? I'm not sure if you can ask it live. Ramya, are you there? Okay, Ramya is um, a soon to be palliative care internal medicine physician from India who was just accepted to Yale. She works with Pallium India. We just worked on a side event together for the Commission on the Status of Women on Caregivers. And her question is, Dr. Matar, could you share what the largest causes of dementia in Zambia are at present and what role can primary palliative care services play in prevention and relief of suffering in these cases? So I'm going to hand the floor back to you, Dr. Matar, to answer that question. Thanks for the question, Ramya. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Ramya. Um, the honest answer is we don't really know. We have very little um, local data, but um, from preliminary surveys that have been done, we're expecting that this will still be Alzheimer's dementia as the most common cause of dementia in Zambia, followed very closely with vascular dementia, 
we have very high um, cardiovascular risk factors in Zambia. So it's, we're expecting Alzheimer's followed by uh, vascular dementia and a lot more infectious related uh, dementias with our high HIV prevalence. Primary palliative care is, will be cardinal for us. We have a lot more primary care workers, primary health care workers, who we are hoping, and this is where the national strategic plan really has to come in, where we train uh, healthcare workers at the primary level to be the, the, the gatekeepers and provide initial palliative care and risk reduction, hoping to improve quality of life. Um, so we, we are working with the primary uh, care providers at a training level and, and hoping that will um, help. Um, thank you, Dr. Mata. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, there were some very nice comments in the chat and in the q and I think I answered all of them. Um, oh, okay, Ramia says she can't um, talk live. This is for those of you, um, it's the first time I've ever run a webinar, so I'm not terribly adept at um, some of the mechanical stuff. But I am going to close the webinar now. We're going to post the recording on um, our website. Our webmaster should be able to um, post it uh, tomorrow. Would any of you, since we've got a few minutes, like to finalize with one comment each for a minute, please, for our audience? Starting with you again, um, Dr. Rumley, uh, Corbera, can you unmute and say yeah. some final things? And then Dr. Laska. Yes, again, it's um, an honor to be able to share our story here in the Philippines. There are many, many other stories to share, but also learning from each other here in this panelist group um, is also very encouraging that, um, you know, we're working on this together. And I think that's the important thing um, in this venue that we get our stories out and we know that we're there for each other to create a stronger voice uh, for our patients needing palliative care, especially those indigent older persons. So again, thank you very much. And thank you for those who have attended. Thanks, Irina. For me as well, it was uh, my pleasure to share my experiences and I want really to like to, to say thank you very much to EAPC for the possibility given to us and for staying all, all the time with us, supporting us to, to continue doing, putting efforts to our stakeholders and work hard and doing advocacy for the development of palliative care and making it available for all the people in need of. Thank you so much. Kristen? I echo these sentiments. Um, I'm grateful for this platform. I think it's really important to talk about palliative care as much and as often as possible, especially um, around uh, when venues are given like the open-ended working group on aging. Um, I think we all know the importance of this field of medicine, but the rest of the world doesn't always. And so anytime that we're given the opportunity to speak about it is a good thing. So thank you for this, Catherine. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Dr. Mata. I, I just have to echo what everyone has said. So thank you as always, Catherine, and um, for inviting us to share our experiences and, and the work we're doing in our, in our areas. And we look forward to sharing more stories about what palliative care looks like and being the voice for the hundreds and hundreds of other people who are behind us doing wonderful things. Uh, so thank you everyone. Thanks, Dr. Mata. I just saw some more questions in the chat. Um, one for you, Dr. Corbera. It says, to May, what was the result of the public honoring you undertook in your country from Sherry Malumo? I don't know if she's still on, but could you answer that briefly? Sorry, it's, we're at the end. The public honoring, I love that. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Yes, it actually really, it was one of the first uh, things we did in that size of a the commercial area and it sparked really more of awareness and how important it is to remember uh, those older persons in our community and the importance of honoring them. So it made also uh, created a network. Um, it linked us with other possible uh, providers of this care at the same time, uh, partners uh, for palliative care in our immediate community, not necessarily in the healthcare, but in the community itself, among families, among uh, businesses, 
um, that saw this exhibit in the mall and also learn more about palliative care through, through that exhibit. So it was a ripple, <laughs> hopefully that was made into a wave and um, it's something we want to uh, do again and perhaps encourage other communities to do regularly. Yeah, it's certainly a great example. I could I could see it's it's relatively low budget to do and and wonderful. And then one more question from Ramala Ramana Dawla, who's our advocacy focal point in Bangladesh. Thank you for sharing the excellent work. And she wanted to know about compassionate communities, which um, Ramana, you may know that that's going to be the focus of um, World Hospice and Palliative Care Day in October is compassionate communities. So stay tuned for that. And it is mostly volunteer, uh, but there are some great um, that you can look on, on the web and find some really good information about compassionate communities. But WHPCA, our sister global organization, um, is mainly working on that for the October event. So I'm going to close this now. Uh, we're right on time. And those of you who are at the open-ended working group, please say the words palliative care in the plenary, in public, and talk about the need for it. And thank you to these wonderful panelists. Um, and the web, the recording will be posted and the chat will be available. And if I didn't answer your question, I'm sorry, I'll get to it and I'll write to you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.